As you know, last week we began a real brief little series called This Is Us. And what we're doing is we're looking at the three core values that we have as a church. This is who we are. You go, core values, what is that? Th- these are the activities. These are the things that we seek to do as a church to make us the church that we are. And so what are the three values that we have as a church? They are worship, grow, and serve. Now, do we do those three things perfectly? No, because we're broken people. We live in a broken world. But whenever we seek as a church to worship God passionately, and we seek to grow and follow the Lord and grow up spiritually, and we seek to find a place of service, it's amazing how God steps in and fills in the gaps. And God wants us to be that kind of church. Now, last week, we looked at the foundational principle of worship. Everything that we do here flows from worship. And if we get worship right, then it's amazing how everything else flows from that. But today, we're going to talk about the second core value, and that is grow. God wants you to grow spiritually. Did you know God wants you to grow spiritually? He doesn't want you to live your life as a spiritual baby. He doesn't want you to live your life in the terrible twos, you know? He doesn't want you to live your life as a self-absorbed middle schooler spiritually. No, God wants you to grow up and mature and start looking like Jesus Christ. But we got to choose to grow up. According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the average baby born in America weighs seven pounds and, you know, six ounces. But a few Years back, there was a baby born in Texas that busted the Guinness Book of World Records. If this baby right here in Texas a few years back, 16 pounds. Can you imagine? My question is, did the mother live, right? I mean, really, because it's just crazy, right? 16-pound baby. But let me be honest with you. I've seen bigger babies than that in church. 150-pound babies and 180-pound babies and over 200-pound babies. These people that, you know what, haven't really grown up spiritually. They say they follow Christ, but they're just still spiritual babes. Well, God wants you to grow up, but you've got to make a decision. It just doesn't come natural. You've got to decide to implement certain disciplines in your life, and that's what we're going to study today. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is going to talk about how we grow up as a spiritual body. And what's amazing is every verse of the text we're looking at today, Paul's encouraging us to grow up. Check it out. Look at it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, God's word says this. And he, that's Christ, gave to what? The church. Gave to the church the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, that's pastors, and teachers to do what? To equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, adulthood, to the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro from the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, every verse that we just read, Paul's saying to us again and again, grow up, spiritually mature, quit acting like children. But it's not automatic. You've got to have a desire to grow, and you've got to put into your life certain disciplines. So what I want to do today is I want to just sort of put things on the bottom shelf so that you can grow spiritually. A a mom analogy. Whenever I was growing up, my mom bought us cookies, put them in a cookie jar, Now, she bought these cheap old vanilla wafer cookies, okay? But mom didn't really want us to eat cookies, and so she put the cookie jar on top of the refrigerator all the way back. And so we didn't ever eat cookies growing up. Why? Because they were literally out of reach. Now, something happened when my mom became a grandma. In my mom's kitchen, she had a lazy Susan on the bottom shelf and she stacked it with junk food. Not cheap vanilla wafers, no. Chocolate chip cookies, 
with real chocolate chips and double stuffed Oreo cookies. Oh my goodness, I I'm not bitter, I'm just telling you the truth here, okay? <laughs> and so what happened is that the grandkids, anytime they wanted to, they just go into the kitchen, turn the lazy suitors in and munch down all they wanted to. Why? Because it was on the bottom shelf. Now, what we're going to do today is I'm going to put this on the bottom shelf for you. These are all principles. Nothing's going to be revolutionary. It's all things that you know to be true, but you don't put them into practice. It's much like our health. We know that if we eat right and exercise, we're going to be healthier, right? But we don't want to do that. Well, these four things are critical for your spiritual growth, and if you'll implement them, I guarantee you will grow. Now, I want to put this on the bottom shelf, and so what I'm going to do, as I go through these four points, I'm going to eat a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> Actually, I'm not. But what I am going to do is I'm going to give you an analogy. I'm going to give you an acrostic that spells grow, G-R-O-W. And if for each one of those letters of the word grow, we're going to learn a key ingredient of how you can grow spiritually. So you ready? Bottom shelf, very simple, but you need to do all four starts with G. Jot this down. G stands for get connected in the church. Get connected to the church. You cannot grow on your own. You have to be connected with the church. Now, I'll hear people that say, well, I don't need the church. Look, I agree. You do not need the church to save you, but without the church, it will stunt you. You will not grow spiritually without making a commitment to get involved and be a part of a local church. That's what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about the body of Jesus Christ, the church. Check it out. Look what he says, verse 15. He says, we are to grow up in every way into him who's the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, look at how we're described, joined and held together. Circle joined and held together. Now, let me ask you, does that describe your commitment to church? You're joined. You're held together. You're connected here. And you go, well, is it really all that important? Yes, it is. Just take the body analogy for a second. Imagine if I detached a member of my physical body from the rest of the body. Let's just say that I, I detached one of my fingers, right? And here I got it, right here, okay? And I detached this finger, and um, here it is. I pulled it from the rest of the body. Now, what's going to happen to this finger? It, can it feel anything? Can it... Um, point anything? Can it do anything? Can it move on its own? No. What's going to happen to this detached member? I'll tell you what's going to happen. It's going to eventually rot and decay and stink. That's some of y'all. Why? Because you're detached from the body of Jesus Christ. But whenever that member is attached, what happens? The blood flows. The nerve endings are connected. See, it suddenly is able to move. Why? Because it's attached to the rest of the body. You grow when you're attached to the rest of the body. You go, how does that work? Well, notice again how Paul starts this passage off. Verse 11. Look at what he says. He says, Christ gave to the church what? Apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds, that's pastors and teachers, to do what? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body. See, when you come to church and you get connected, suddenly you're being poured into. You're being equipped. You experience something in weekly worship that you will never experience in the world. You can't. There's some spiritual dynamic that happens when we come here and worship the Lord together. In fact, you will hear spiritual truths from this pulpit that you'll never hear from the world. Why? Because the world's not going to teach you the word of God. And, and so you've got to hear the truth. You've got to grow in the truth. What I've discovered so many times is that Christians, they decide church really isn't all that important. And they slip away. I've been a pastor over 30 years. I've seen this hundreds of times. I see people that come to faith and they're growing spiritually. Oh my goodness, they're in the word. You can see them sort of up front here. They're worshiping Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. They're taking notes. They're all in. And man, God is changing them right and left. It's incredible. But then something happened. Life happens. Difficulties. Sickness, a trial, change of job. Okay, miss a couple Sundays and you sort of get out of the habit. And next thing you know, well, it's really not all that important anyway. And then what do you do? You, you don't see them as, as often. And I'm not picking on anybody here, but I have noticed, this is just purely observation. I notice that when that happens, they start moving farther and farther back. 
okay? Sort of the back row or the balcony. Again, not pointing out to anybody. I'm just saying, hey, I've observed this. And then after a while you go, where are they? I haven't seen them in months. And then you hear what? You hear that crazy things have happened. Man, yeah, no, they're going through a divorce. Or man, that, that guy made this decision and wow, it just wrecked his family. And you go, how did he do that? That's craziness. I'll tell you, it's very simple. They neglected the most basic discipline of the Christian life, being connected to the church. Look, look we're, we're not the end all. Coming to church on Sunday is not the end all, but it's the beginning. And your most important relationship is Jesus Christ. And once you got that relationship taken care of, your second most important relationship is the church of Jesus Christ. It's his body. It's his bride. You need to make a commitment to be a part of it. That is where spiritual growth begins. G, get connected in a church. Then R. What does R stand for? Jot this down. Read God's word. You need to read God's Word. Every single day, you need to open up the Word of God. You need to download it on your phone. Every opportunity you get, you need to read the Word of God. You need to, you know, get in a devotional. Get some Bible study tools. Get in God's Word. You've heard me say this before. You open up the Bible, God opens up His mouth. Your spiritual life will rise or fall based on how much you're in the Word of God. It's just that simple. You've got to be in God's Word on a regular basis. Now, I love the way that Peter puts this. Here it is Mother's Day. Here's a great Mother's Day verse. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. What does Peter say? Like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it, the word of God, you may grow. You, as a Christian, are to crave the word of God just like a newborn baby craves its mother's milk. You're to be that hungry for the word of God. And whenever you start Hungering for the word of God, you will spiritually start growing up. That's what Paul's talking about. Look at it, Ephesians 4, 13. Paul says this, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge, see that's from the word of God, the knowledge of the son of God, to a mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. See, what happens is, is that you grow up. And whenever you start maturing, you stop acting like a bunch of little kids around here. You go, whoa, this is the way I'm supposed to act. This is the way I'm supposed to respond to my marriage. This is the way I'm supposed to respond with my kids. This is the way I'm supposed to respond at work. This is how I'm supposed to respond. Oh, this is what it looks like. And then look at the result. Paul tells us, verse 14, so that we, when we've grown up, may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. When you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And suddenly, whenever God's word is getting into your heart, you know what happens? It starts changing you. And you're not blown away by every new wind and craze that's out there, some effective preacher or some professor that you heard. Or you know what? You're not driven by the, the waves of your emotion. No, you're grounded in the word of God. You see, the reason why so many Christians get deceived is because they don't know the word of God. Now, 80% of Americans will say that the Bible is the most influential book in the history of mankind. And yet, only 32% of Americans even read it. And that's why there's such biblical ignorance. 80% of Americans will say this. They believe that the phrase, God helps those who help themselves, is in the Bible. It's not in the Bible, folks. That's Benjamin Franklin, by the way, okay? Okay, and so you've got to get in the word. Why? Because if you don't, you're not going to be grounded and you're going to be pushed around by all the lies this world will feed you. You've probably heard the expression before, a chicken with its head cut off, right? You go, this is a gory sermon today. You know, I don't know. I'm not, I didn't mean it to be, but growing up on the farm, we had chickens. And if we were going to kill and then clean chickens, what we would do, we'd hold the chicken down, we'd get a hatchet, and you'd chop its head off. Now, this is where the fun begins, because what happens is you would then let the chicken go, and it's the craziest thing. The chicken would literally run around, and you know what else? We had once where a chicken ran a few you know, feet, and then it literally flew for a good 10 feet. It was crazy, right? Can I tell you, that's what our culture looks like? It is. Why? Because the head of God's word, the authority of God's word, has been removed from our society. And everybody does what's right in their own eyes, and what's happened is we're being drawn away. And it's true even in the church. 
People that should know better because they don't know the word of God. And so they have some, you know, great articulate preacher on TV who preaches what? You know what's the biggest preaching out there? Health and wealth. That's a false gospel, folks. Health and wealth gospel says this. Okay, if you love Jesus enough and have enough faith, then guess what? You're always going to be healthy and wealthy. And so many Christians buy into that. Why? Because it appeals to our flesh. And it's all because they don't know the word of God. Every morning... When I first get up, I sit down and I open the Bible or I open up some devotional and Susan and I will do a devotion together or whenever I exercise, I will be listening to the word of God or I'll be listening to some other Christian book. Susan and I, we've started another discipline that every week we memorize a couple of verses together. A few weeks back, a, when our memory verse was actually talking about the Bible. It's an incredible promise in God's word about the word. Check it out, look at it. It's found in Psalm chapter one. Verse one says this, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's the word of God. And and on his law, the word, he meditates day and night. What's that person gonna be like? I'll tell you what it's gonna be like. Verse three, he will be like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither and all that he does, he prospers. Can I tell you, that's my testimony? Whenever I graduated from high school, I had a sixth grade reading comprehension. It's true. Think for Florida education. That was me, okay? Graduated, you know? And um, that's why, I also my life was pretty screwed up, but that's why I flunked out my first year of college because I just couldn't, just couldn't handle it. And then I got saved. And God put within my heart a hunger to read the word of God. Day and night, man, I was studying the word. I was reading the word. I was memorizing the word. And literally, I learned to read by reading the Bible. And something supernatural began to happen. I felt God call me into the ministry. I left Florida to go to Texas to go to Bible college. I learned Greek and Hebrew there. By the time I got my master's degree, I was a straight-A student. How? I'll tell you how. Because of the power of the Word of God. You see, whenever you're in the Word of God, it is a supernatural book. This is not a history book. This is a living book. And God will change your life whenever you get into God's word and God's word gets into your heart. Whenever God's word gets in you, I'm telling you, it has power to change us. Alcoholics are made sober. Addicts are suddenly clean. The immoral, they become purified. And liars, they start telling the truth. That's my testimony. And that is all from the power of the word of God. If you want to grow, you cannot bypass this point. You can't. You must be in the word every day. Get Bible study tools. Do whatever it takes, but get in the word of God. You will grow if you get in the word of God. G, get connected in the church. R, read the word of God. O, jot this down. O stands for others. Others involved in my life. I've got to allow others to get close to me and get involved in my life. See, growth will not happen on your own. God wants you to connect with him, and he wants you to connect with his body, the church. We've already talked about that. You see, in the Bible, at the very beginning, God said what? In the book of Genesis, it's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for us to be alone. And yet, statistics tell us that 75% of us as Americans will say that we have many acquaintances, but no close friends. Only 10% of men will say they have even one close friend. You've seen the stories, just came out, big headlines last week. The loneliest generation in the history of humanity is this generation right now. It's crazy. Why are we so lonely? We've got all social media. We should be all connected, but we're not. We're all alone. And it can happen right in the church as well. See, it's real easy to become part of the crowd and not really be a part of the community. In our church, we have nine weekend worship services. We have over 5,700 members in this church. It's real easy to become part of the crowd here. Folks, glad you're here. Glad you're part of the crowd. I want you to be a part of a community. I want you to have relationships where you're connecting with. I want you to get involved in a small group. Life-on-life relationships, that's how we really grow. Why? Because I'll tell you why. Whenever you need encouraging words from other people when you're down, 
And you know what? You need truthful words from people whenever you're being deceived. And you need rebuking words whenever you're going into sin, and you need loving words to get you out of that sin. But that doesn't happen in here. It only happens whenever you are connected in true relationships. That's what Paul's talking about. Look at what he says, verse 15. He says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. In your outline circle, speaking the truth in love, that's authentic relationships. Now, I love the balance of the word of God. We're to speak the truth, but we're also to do it in love. You gotta have both. A lot of people go to extremes. They'll speak the truth, but they won't do it in love. And so it's harsh and critical and judgmental. We're just a bunch of Pharisees, right? And then the other extreme is, okay, I'm gonna speak in love, but I'm not gonna give you any truth. Well, that's just wishy-washy and unbalanced, and it's just as bad. You gotta have both. You gotta speak the truth in love, but you're only gonna do that if it's people you're connected with. I love the way Solomon puts this in Proverbs 27, verse 5. He says, an open rebuke is better than hidden love. Wounds from a friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. You see, whenever you see a brother or sister beginning to drift away from the Lord, you've got to love them enough to go to them and say, hey, can we get together? Can we have coffee together? Can we have lunch this week? I mean, I had to do it twice this week. Twice this week, I had to go to one of my brothers in Christ. And you say things, you know what? I love you too much to be silent, to let your marriage break apart. I love you too much. Went to another one. I love you too much to allow this area of your life. You are losing your integrity at work. I've got to say something here, right? Or maybe you go to a friend and go, you know what, I love you too much. The guy you're dating is a mess. You need to pray and ask God for wisdom in that relationship. I don't know what it may be, but can I tell you something? You won't have those kind of hard conversations in here with people you really don't know. It's gotta be people that you're connected with. People in my small group, they can have those kind of conversations with me and I can with them as well. But the good thing about relationships, because sometimes you go, okay, get in a small group so people can be correcting me all the time. Can I just tell you, the the majority of conversations that happen in small groups is not correcting. You know what it is? It's encouragement and love. Because every one of us, we have our valleys, we have our hard times, our kids are going astray. You know, there's a health issue, there's a death in a family, there's a job situation, and we have all these situations, and you know what we need? We need people speaking in our lives, encouraging us, saying, hey, don't give up, we love you, we're praying for you. Don't we all need that? I think my favorite analogy of this in nature is geese flying in the V formation. We've all seen that before. I love that. I mean, you probably understand why they fly in the V formation, right? Because what it is, science tells us, that with every flap of the wing, the goose directly behind it has an updraft. And that literally geese together can fly 71% farther than a goose flying by itself. But what's amazing is that there's a different point goose up front all the time. They rotate. And so whenever the guy up front is tired, he moves to the back. And then they move on up. And they're honking to each other. And what happens is, is that, you know what? If one of them gets injured or hurt or sick, he'll drop away and two others will go with him. And whenever he's healthy enough to fly again, they'll all three go off together. I mean, I love that analogy. That's the church right there. And then the thing that I love the most is the honking, right? Isn't that cool? I mean, what they've discovered, that the lead goose is not the one doing the honking. You know who's doing all the honking? It's all the geese in the back. You know what they're saying? Honk. Keep on flapping. Doing a good job up there. Keep it going. It's awesome back here. Thanks so much. Honk, honk, right? That's what's going on. Well, that's what we need in the body of Jesus Christ, We need people honking into our lives. It looks like, okay, man, you're starting to walk away from your faith or from the Lord or from church. Honk, honk, don't give up. I mean, you're you're thinking about walking away from your marriage. Honk, honk, don't give up. You're thinking about ending it all and taking your life. Honk, honk, don't give up. You need people in your life that are encouraging you, honking you on, right? And listen, that doesn't happen in the crowd. It only happens in the community. And the way we do it as a church is we get involved in small groups. 
You hear us talk about small groups all the time here. So this is what I encourage you to do. You can go this on your outline. You can see this. You can type in sbcsmallgroups.com. You go to that simple website. I'm telling you, within five minutes, you can fill that out. It'll send it to one of our men, um, folks on our small group t- ministry team. They'll connect you with a small group. It is just that simple. But you've got to make the choice. Okay? Small groups is the primary way we try to connect as a large church and encourage each other and grow. So if you want to grow, G, you've got to get connected to the church. Make that a commitment. R, you've got to read God's word. Oh, you got to allow others into your life. Not just here in church, but you got to get in a small group. But then the final thing, W, is this. Jot this down. you got to work for Jesus. you got to work for Jesus. you got to get involved in the ministry. Do you want to see immature Christians? It's those that are spectators. It's that those that are on the sidelines, the, the pew sitters, those are the immature Christians. Why? Because whenever you step up and you get involved in some ministry, it's crazy how you start growing spiritually. Do you know why? Because you're so dependent on the Lord to help you and empower you. Let me, let me illustrate it like this. Imagine that you're a third grade small group leader. And you know every Sunday, 10 third graders are going to be looking at you to guide them spiritually. Do you know what that does? That drives you to your knees and says, God, I need your help. It drives you in the Word so that you can be able to teach and lead those kids the right way. It's crazy how much you'll grow spiritually that way. In fact, let me put it to you like this. As a pastor, I grow a whole lot more as a teacher than I ever did as a student. Whenever you take the lead, God steps up. Notice how this is written. Paul ends this passage in verse 16. Notice how Paul writes this. Verse 16. From whom the whole body is joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. In your outline circle, each part is working properly. What does that mean? That means you you got to work properly. Every person in this room, God has a ministry, a job for you to start working properly. Now, what I've discovered statistically, we've all heard this before, that typically in any church, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And though our statistics at our church may be a little better than that, by and large, it's still the same. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Now, let's use a body analogy. If only 20% of your physical body was operating properly, what would happen? You'd be in ICU right now, right? You would. And we wonder, why is the church so anemic? Why is the church so ineffective in this world? Because I'll tell you why. Only 20% of it's working properly. One of the analogies I love is the fact that our body has a skeletal system that sort of holds everything together. And have you ever thought... Okay, what kind of bone am I in the body of Jesus Christ? What I've discovered through the years, there are some church members and some attenders that you know what they are? They are um, jawbones. They talk a good game, but they don't do anything. And then there are some people that are wishbones. I wish the church would do this. I wish the church would do that, but they don't do anything. And then you got the knuckle bones. And they knock everything that goes on, but they don't really do anything either. And then, you know what? There are the backbones. And I am so thankful for many of you who are backbones of this church. You keep this place stable the way it's supposed to be. And so don't just talk it. Don't just wish it. Don't just knock it. Do something. You go, well, how do you do something? Well, you plug into ministry. I shared this last week. It's real simple. You can go to that website and see it there on your outline sbcserve.com. You can go to that website and you can see hundreds of ministries that we have in a church. And in those ministries, just different needs that we have as a church where you can plug in. And I'm telling you, after you discover the ministries you like, within five minutes, you can sign up for something. And somebody from that ministry in the months ahead will contact you and will equip you and train you to do that ministry. But you've got to choose to get involved. And you may go, I'm not really sure where I'm supposed to do, what I'm supposed to do. Well, what I've discovered through the years is that a lot of it is trial and error. You know, it is. You know, you've, I call it the spaghetti principle. You know when spaghetti's done, how? You throw a piece against the wall. 
And if it sticks, it's done. If it slides down, it needs to be cooked a little bit longer, right? Well, that's what I'm asking you to do. Will you just find some place, throw it against the wall, try it out for a season of time, pour yourself into it, be faithful to it, but if it doesn't stick, awesome. There's hundreds of other ministries you can get involved in. Just do something. You find a ministry. I guarantee that if you will get connected and committed to this church, you'll read God's word every day, you will allow others into your life, and you'll find a place where you can work and serve Jesus, you will grow radically. It will change your life. That is how God wants you to grow.